Hello and welcome to Hard Labour on Labour Social. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Julia Grace Patterson, author of the book Critical, Why the NHS is Being Betrayed and How We Can Fight For It. So welcome to the show, Julia. So Julia, first thing I want to ask is, what made you write this book? Well, uh, that's a big question. Um, I've been campaigning for the NHS for staff and patients and their well-being for seven or eight years now. And there's a growing number of people who are aware of the problems in the NHS. But the media broadly don't scrutinise what's going on very closely. And because of that, we get these kind of snapshots of what's going wrong at particular times of the year, for example, in the winter. And then we lose the sort of opportunity to analyze what's going on in between the winter periods and so every single winter we have one of these awful crises happening and I think it's time actually to harness all of the energy that people have who want to fight for the NHS and set out what we want from the service because yeah. what's happening is the NHS is being pulled away from its original principles of providing a comprehensive service which is free for all where people are treated um, based on their clinical need. And the NHS is in the worst state it's ever been. Um, we haven't got any time to lose. We need to start speaking up for what we want from the service. And ultimately, it's politicians we need to be holding to account. I think books can be really powerful. So I've tried to write quite a short book, which is quite to the point, And it's a manifesto for change. There's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of bad stuff obviously happening in the in the NHS. And I think what we need to hold on to is the fact that there's a lot of great people out there who want things to change. And if we can come together and call for the same things, I think we've got a hope of reversing the problems that politicians have brought into the NHS over the years. OK, so in the book, you give an analogy about the NHS being a bit like a car that's 75 years old. So I'll let you tell it. Well, what's the analogy? Yeah, so when any government takes charge of the NHS, they're taking on a service which has been going for decades and decades. And one of the problems we've had in the NHS is that politicians have looked at it in a very short termist way, tried to do things to the service, even when they've had good intentions, which hasn't cost a lot of money. So over the years, any public service is going to need infrastructure changes from time to time, for example like the building of new roads or new schools or for example in the nhs you need new hospitals from time to time but we've had lots of groups of politicians over the years that haven't taken the difficult expensive decision in their tenure they've left it for you know the next set of politicians or whatever and so i've constructed this analogy which is basically like the nhs has to keep going all the time it's it's very old lots of bits of it are old some of the buildings some of the services some of the structures and what politicians should be doing when they're in charge of running the service is looking at the processes looking at the tech looking at the state of the hospitals whether repairs need to be done and looking broadly as well at our society and whether changes need to be made because healthcare moves on and medicine moves on and yet what we've seen recently, certainly with this current group of politicians, is that the service is deteriorating. Lots of the yeah. buildings need repairs. In England alone, for example, there's over £10 billion now of unmet repairs in the NHS. And instead of tackling that problem, paying the money to stop, for example, sewage leaking into maternity units in A&E departments, the current politicians aren't taking on that challenge. They're not putting the money where it needs to go. And instead, they're doing things like funneling large sums of money into the private sector. And so the car analogy, which probably makes a lot more sense if you read it in the book, quite frankly, is this idea that the NHS is a very old car driving along a road. And the people who are having to manage the car in the driving seat are the healthcare professionals. They just have to keep this service going, no matter what the politicians throw at it. And the people in the back seat, the passengers, are like the patients. And if it's not functioning properly because there aren't enough beds in the NHS or because it's too busy and the waiting lists are too long, they're like bumps in the road. And the people who are affected by the bumps are the patients in the back. 
And the people who have the, you know, the control of the car, the ones who could change it, who could take it and give it a service or pay for a new part or give it a lick of paint, that's the politicians. Yeah. But too often the politicians blame the staff for the problems in the NHS. And it's nonsensical because the staff just have to drive that car in whatever state it's in. And the patients have to sit in the back and just absorb whatever problems are going on in the NHS. I think we have a real problem because politicians aren't really taking responsibility for the problems. Yeah. And they're making budgetary decisions and policy decisions on behalf of all of us. Yeah. But they're doing it in a really short termist way. You know, they're not thinking, what's it going to be like in 10 years time if I don't fix this leak? They're just ignoring it. And then it will have to get picked up by the next set of politicians or the next one. And, you know, meanwhile, our buildings are crumbling and in some of these places with the repairs, for example, Graham, we've got situations now where patients and staff are at significant safety risks and still the politicians aren't acting. It's not even mentioned and it's not even mentioned in the future policy manifestos either. If you look at the manifestos that Labour are coming out well, with, for example. I was about to come on to this because yeah. in the book you're quite <clears throat> critical of, of Labour as well. There's a point where you talk about you used to have a good relationship under every doctor. And we need to talk a little bit about every doctor as well, about how all that got started. But um, you had a better relationship with Labour MPs. But more recently, uh, you've found that they're all singing from the same hymn sheet. Maybe you're getting just standard stock answers when you ask questions. Is that you've been your experience? So I think anyone who's listening to this probably knows that Labour's a broad church, right? There's there's different groups within Labour and not, you know, it's not a homogenous group of politicians with completely aligned views on everything. Um, just to give people a little bit of background. So I started and I run an organisation called Every Doctor, which is a non-profit campaigning organisation. And we were set up to advocate for staff and patients in the NHS. My background is as a medical doctor, but I don't work clinically anymore, I do this full time. But during the pandemic, we were about a year old as an organization when the pandemic started. And we became very busy very quickly because we started running weekly parliamentary briefings for MPs across the spectrum. We would send out emails to all MPs in the UK, inviting them along, to hear from frontline NHS doctors about what was happening. Oh, wow, so and that was we, like a free forum. You you just um, gave them the link and they could join if they wanted to. Yeah, we wow. set up a small group of volunteers who would telephone every single MP office in the country every single week. It was an absolute <laughs> operation, Graham. And we were receiving a lot of information from the frontline because we run a really strong network of UK doctors. So yeah. every week we would have a different group of UK doctors turning up to speak to politicians for 45 minutes about a particular pertinent problem. And now these are things that we all know about. But at the time, in early April 2020, we were bringing up things like the fact that broken and warped PPE was being sent out to GP surgeries or the fact that the staff workforce were having lots of mental health problems or the fact that PPE was um, seemingly going to some parts of the NHS and not others and we didn't really have all the answers for that so we were bringing that information to any MP who wanted to turn up and it was incredible actually we ran a campaign called protect nhs workers at the time and over 100 mps came on board the campaign we lobbied together for various protections to safeguard the workforce and their patients and we won a couple of policy changes as a result and we got to know a lot of mps i mean i know a lot of mps because of that because i think if you're in an intense situation like that you do you know they were coming each week i was speaking on the phone to some of them had direct line to a lot of people and you know they were some people were really really engaged and it won't surprise anyone I don't think to find out that there was a handful of conservative politicians who would engage and a number of MPs from different parties but Labour Labour had the biggest representation within the people that I got to know and who used to come to our briefings every week and we used to feel that when we emailed all of the MPs about a particular issue, which we did regularly, for example, by starting a petition or lobbying for a particular thing, we would get individual responses from a huge number of MPs. And so you could tell what their particular preferences were or what their priorities were. And that was really powerful. Um, and also groups of MPs were kind of coming together and working on particular issues, sometimes in a cross-party way. It was quite collaborative, which was also fantastic. 
But what we've been finding in the last year or so, and my sense is that this is since Starmer has become more organised in his messaging and the party has started planning for the next election and what their manifesto promises are going to be. We have found that when we email MPs in the same way that we've been doing for three years, we receive a lot more stock responses now from yeah. Labour MPs. And I don't, for anyone who doesn't know what stock response is, because I didn't know before I started doing all of this, but each of the political parties has a central communications department and on particular issues which are important and pertinent and that MPs are asked about, they'll construct messaging that helps MPs to talk about what the party are trying to do on a particular issue or their stance on a particular thing. And it's a real problem in a situation where you've got a crisis going on where people are yeah. having safety problems, right? Because this winter that's just gone past was the worst winter ever in the NHS. I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anyone to hear that, but it was really, really it horrifying. Horrific. I, I, I had a little bit of dealings with it um, and it was yeah. yeah, off the charts, kind of concerning the fact that it was taking hours for emergency ambulances to reach people that I knew. I mean, this wasn't just something I read about in the newspapers. This was yeah. actually going on in real time. When you were talking about stock responses, though, as a veteran of the Brexit wars, I'm very, very used to stock responses from MPs, and it is incredibly frustrating, I have to say. Really, really frustrating. And quite often, the stock responses don't even answer the question that you'll have posed. It will be no. something sort of vaguely related, but different. It's like chat it's very GPT. <laughs> <laughs> the stock answer. in fact i had a meeting with one of these communications departments about six months ago and they were incredibly defensive about the stuff that they themselves are doing and it was really yeah. that was really frustrating as well but anyway um so when we came into last winter in the sort of autumn time we knew what was going to happen because as we emerged from the pandemic the waiting lists were getting longer and longer and longer we could see what was happening and through our network we hear about things quicker than the media will pick it up because doctors will message us saying for example i'm an a and e consultant and this is what's happened today this patient's been waiting x number of hours i'm a bit worried things are getting worse you know so we kind of get yeah. the early warning sounds of this sort of thing so we decided to start a campaign last autumn going into the winter knowing what was going to happen which was horrible in itself and we started running emergency parliamentary briefings over the winter and we did three altogether um and the engagement dropped off from politicians mostly labor politicians and we yeah started getting these stock responses and the thing that was really horrifying about it graham was this wasn't a sort of let's have a long-term conversation about your promises for the nhs and what might happen in five or ten years time yeah. this was us emailing saying frontline doctors are terrified for the safety of their patients who are dying because of the circumstances in the nhs can we please have an urgent conversation with you because this is a humanitarian crisis and up to 500 people are dying per week because they can't access urgent care and we were getting these stock responses telling us what they hoped to do if they won the next general election and i was absolutely horrified by that i don't think it's right um but, but i don't think it's right for any politician to be sending out emails like that but particularly when you're the political <laughs> yeah. opposition it, it was just ludicrous i can't argue with that sorry <laughs> <laughs> I, I really can't. Um, when we were, we were going to mention about um, Keir Starmer when he was um, standing to be Labour leader, he did talk. He did promise to uh, roll back uh, private outsourcing, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, one of the things that I've been speaking to other sort of Labour Party MPs and members about is the fact that when Starmer run ran or when anyone runs as leader, it's what they would like to do if. It was a dictatorship. It's not a mm -hmm. dictatorship. It's got to be a decision taken by all the shadow cabinet together, collective responsibility, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of get that. But at the same time, you've got a very good point where you're like, I'm not talking about policy in five, 10, 15 years time. I'm talking about what the problem is right now, the crisis that we had this winter in the NHS, which a lot of people seem to have forgotten about. It seems to have just dropped out of the news agenda. No one talks about it in the media much. But literally hundreds perhaps thousands of people died unnecessarily mm -hmm. waiting yeah. for ambulances in an ambulance outside a hospital waiting in a hospital to be seen it was just it was it was it, it was like something from a, a developing nation yeah, well and there was some stuff put on twitter which was really thought-provoking at the time graham where people would say things like 
imagine if a plane load of people crashed every single week and every person died. I mean, I think that would probably be in the papers and probably politicians would be doing something. But there's some kind of a block at the moment on people recognising how urgent this problem is and how many human lives are being lost. Like, it, yeah. it, it's horrifying. I think it's it remains to be seen, actually, how many people in terms of excess deaths will have died. You know, that that information tends to come out a bit later. It doesn't tend to get the media scrutiny it needs. But, um, you know, what needs to be recognised, I think, and this is horrible, is that politicians' actions are having a direct impact on people living or dying now. I mean, that yeah. needs to be recognised. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get on to the demonisation of GPs and, and things in a moment. But mm. first of all, we're talking about uh, this uh, private outsourcing, and this is a big part of your book, um, not just PFI, which I'll come on to in a minute. But uh, in the book, you say that the government spent almost four hundred million pounds, four hundred million pounds, on private companies in twenty twenty one alone to make the NHS more efficient and cost effective. How did that go? Was that money well spent? Did they make it more efficient and more cost effective? Oh, I mean, if you ask, honestly, the people that I speak to, Graham, who are working on the front line of the NHS are so inundated right now and just trying to get as many patients seen as safely as they possibly can do. So I don't really understand how any of these broader conversations about improving processes or efficiency or any of that can really be focused on right now because the workforce is just under so much pressure and they're not being heard enough, you know. Actually, what the government should be doing and spending their money on is staff and listening to staff. Because if you think about it, any local healthcare area, you know, if you sat the nurses down, sat the doctors down and said, what are the things that are inefficient in your department? What could we be improving on? What do you think would work better if we changed? They'd be able to give you all the answers. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to cost 400 you know, million, is it? No, in some of these places, Graham, don't have a functioning printer or a telephone or, you know, the door's broken or there's sewage leaking in the wall. I mean, you'd imagine that that would be the kind of the first port of call if you're looking for things to improve. But yeah. but no, we've got millions of pounds to spend on external management consultant agencies. And I'm not trying to say that anyone is intentionally, you know, I don't, I'm not blaming any of these management consultants. I don't think they're actively trying to make things worse. It's just in terms of priorities. I just think it's a bit of a luxury at the moment to be spending money on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in the book, you talk about the PFI schemes. This is uh, something that was brought in mostly under Blair and, and Brown, which was uh, essentially, as, as I understand it, they borrowed money to pay back over many years to improve the hospitals that were there at the moment. Now we have, here we are 20 years later, we're still saddled with this debt that is still being paid for by individual NHS trusts. And this is billions yeah. of pounds that could be spent on patients and healthcare yeah. and medicine mm -hmm. and doctor's mm -hmm. wages, and nurses' wages and healthcare professionals' wages. And it's going to these private companies and will do on for the next few decades. Now, has, has yeah. PFI been phased out now? They said that that's a bad idea. It has, yeah. But I saw something the other day talking about, it was, you know, I can't remember the name of the hospital that it involved, but someone was talking about, oh, we might need to be looking for some financing elsewhere. And I thought, oh, God, this is going to get stuffed up again now. I mean, the problem is, Graham, um, and again, it's one of these things that's a systemic problem. You can point the finger at one person and say it's your fault. But the way that the NHS is run as a public service yeah. politicians think about things in very short-term ways and hospitals and all infrastructure of that nature like roads schools whatever is incredibly expensive to build and um, even if you could recognize that the hospitals need rebuilding or the roads or schools or whatever else it's an enormous outlay of public funds to do any of those things and so too many of our governments over the last few decades haven't wanted to do it they've just kicked the can down the road and then the next group of politicians get lumbered with the same problem and pfi i think probably emerged as an idea because of that because it seemed incredibly attractive we could have all these new hospitals and things and yet the public wasn't having to pay for it all up front but of course what's happened why? is we're paying for it now aren't we why didn't they just borrow it off themselves like just i, what, what, I don't really because the as far as I know, the government can borrow off the Bank of England, which is basically a branch of the government. So when we talk about our debt that we've got to repay, it's to ourselves. And if that's just added on, 
and it, it well, blows my mind. Well, in the long term, the interest, yeah, I mean, the interest we've paid on these is absolutely astronomical. Well, yeah, you've got figures in your book saying the NHS PFI schemes had a value of about, what, 12.8 billion, I think it is? Yeah. Um, but with by around 2050, the taxpayer would have paid out over 80 billion yeah. for the hospitals and other yeah. facilities that came in. So, yeah, not great value for money. But like you say, that's, that, that's been kicking the can down the road for ages. But another thing is that you highlight in the book is that if it's a PFI hospital or, you know, partly funded or whatever, there's a bit of a monopoly going on about service charges. Mm -hmm. I didn't know mm -hmm. about this. And you give two examples. You have one example where the NH an NHS trust was charged £242 to change a padlock on a garden gate. And another mm -hmm. was charged £13,000 to install three lights in a garden. Nice work I think if this, you can get it. <laughs> well, it's just extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, so these maintenance contracts were set up with some of the PFI schemes at the same time as the building. So yeah. what happens is the private company builds the hospital or whatever it is. They own it and we lease it off them. And some of these organisations set up schemes where they would also have to be employed to do the maintenance of the hospital. And of course, like you say, it's then a monopoly. They can charge what they want on basic maintenance costs. And some of these things are absolutely ludicrous, Graham. It's just, I, you know, I know lots of people who've worked in PFI hospitals. There's stupid stuff that goes on, like something breaks and you can't just get it fixed in, in a normal practical yeah. sense, going and getting a light bulb or whatever it is. You have to call up some maintenance company, takes ages and then it costs a fortune. And you no, know, all of this is public money. It's it's really, I mean, I think the whole thing's gross, quite honestly. I think it's horrible. Um, and I don't think the public are properly aware that all this goes on, you know. No. Um, meanwhile, the government is sort of quibbling over staff wages and things like that. And, you know, you think the staff are the ones trying to keep this thing going. It's awful. Well, I, thinking of my experience with uh, this kind of thing was with my father, who's been diagnosed with he's got terminal um, vascular dementia. Mm. And in the, it was like the height of COVID 2020. It was the height of the Eat Out to Help Out campaign by our now Prime Minister Rishi Sunak or the Eat Out to Spread the Virus um, campaign. And we had, uh, my dad went into hospital. It took ages to get him out of hospital because of the COVID lockdown rules. Finally, he got out and he was put in palliative care. And we had care workers coming four times a day and they were a private company. So, mm. but they're being paid for by the taxpayer. So they'll mm. cost more than the NHS. And these these people working for a private company were not equipped with the proper proper um, uh, PPE, and you kind of think, hang on, if you're going to make that leap to say, well, this should be privatised, really care for elderly people who are suffering from dementia, that's something that the the state shouldn't have to take care of, which blows my mind. But if you're going to make an argument of that, surely you'd say, well, they'll give a better service than the state would or the NHS would, and it's that's not true because they were turning up without masks or they weren't wearing the masks properly um one of them had a, a visor and i said uh did, did, did were you given that I said no i had to buy it and i asked if they were getting regular covid tests said, no and these people were going from vulnerable person to vulnerable vulnerable person in, mm -hmm. in the different communities and as a result of that within a week of my dad getting out of hospital he had covid i had covid and my mom had covid no, oh, that's terrible isn't it i mean that's horrible i'm so sorry that that's happened to you and your family graham and it's one tiny example of what can happen when you know you've got these separate agencies involved because if you think about it the government should have had a responsibility of care to all of the care workers all of the nhs workers yes. and everyone you know um i think that's terrible and and there's loads of examples about how when privatisation comes into the NHS, there's maybe this sense that because it's private, it's going to be fancier or something. Yeah, it's going you know, to be, be better. Yeah. A lot of the time, that is not the case. I that's mean, it's not been my even... experience. I know the plural of anecdote isn't data, but mm -hmm. that's still the experience of me. I know, I know the people that I know who, yeah, you know, and I know people who've, who've had to have an operation that's been private but paid for by the NHS, and they, you know, they had a really great experience of, of that, but. Generally speaking, uh, well, you talk in the book about the fact that the private sector is not going to swoop in and save the NHS. You talk about there only being about 850, 60-odd equivalent, full-time equivalent doctors in the private sector 
compared with yeah. over 150,000 doctors employed by the NHS. So yeah. the, the idea that they, the, the private sector can save the NHS is for the birds. The whole thing is a nonsense. I mean, and this is one of my biggest criticisms, actually, about Starmer and Streeting's plans, because there's been a number of pieces in the media recently where they've said, you know, they've been telling everyone how brilliant it is to involve the private sector in supporting the NHS and saving the NHS, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The reality we have in this country is that most healthcare workers are trained in the NHS. So, you know, publicly trained. We have got a relatively small private sector at the moment. It's growing fast because a lot of people are coming in. Actually, like private companies are finding opportunities in the UK now because mm. our healthcare system is collapsing. But at the moment, it's a small sector. It employs a tiny proportion of our healthcare workers. And because of that, Graham, if, um, if Starmer and Streeting are hell-bent on funneling public money into the private sector to clear these waiting lists in practice that means they're going to be poaching nhs staff to work in the private hospitals um which makes no sense because what they could be doing is just investing in the public service paying the staff properly getting the hospitals working properly expanding what we can provide within the public service and then we would have no need to be using the private sector yeah yeah, well, I mean, you talk in the book about how Labour's not been looking at immediate solution, uh, solutions right now, but focusing more on its manifesto. And, um, yeah, the plan to drive down waiting lists by turning to the private sector, which, I, I don't know, I, think, I really do feel like there needs to be a discussion about this because it doesn't sit right with me. And I can't, you know, as a Labour supporter and, you know, the CEO of Labour Social, I would like to be able to give you reasons why that's a good idea. But honestly, Julia, I, I, at the moment, I can't really do that. I feel like if we all sat down with a big piece of paper and the, the goal was we need to get these waiting lists down as soon as we possibly can, we're going to throw absolutely anything at this and, you know, let's just do everything right now immediately the private sector would probably come into the conversation in a short-term way for that tiny proportion of people who you know work in the private sector and they do have a little bit of capacity and i think amongst a huge number of other things it would be on the list somewhere i think we've got to be pragmatic about that because we could use it a little bit in the short term to bring the waiting list down a little bit but my worry is that i haven't heard star or streeting saying that it's a short-term measure so that's number one and number two is there's been not enough from Starmer or Streeting about supporting the current workforce. And if you yeah. actually think about how the NHS functions and how we could get patients through the system quickly and get them safe and cared for, you would be wanting to bolster that workforce as much as you possibly could, supporting them properly, paying them properly, making sure they're getting mental health support, making sure their working conditions are really good. And I haven't heard any of that. I've heard Streeting a lot of times telling us that he's going to train up X number of thousand more of this number of staff or whatever. But but there's a group of people right now, a very large group of professionals who aren't getting the support they need. And I can't understand why Labour aren't talking about that. I get that. I get that. I mean, yeah. Um, it, it, also in the, your book, you talk about the fact that a Lancet study showed that NHS services ran by private healthcare companies between 2013 and 2020 had been linked to a decline in quality of patient care and significant increased rates of treatable mortality. Um, but just to move on to support for doctors, uh, support for healthcare staff, um, I mean, when we talk about the pandemic, G January 2021, in your book, you say the ONS data shows that 883 health and social, sta social staff um, had lost their lives in the UK, mostly due to getting COVID. A big part of that was not having access to decent PPE. Um, but then we've also got the situation where um, the, the, you talk about the Laura Hyde Foundation, uh, which provides mental health support, uh, a mental health support network uh, for people in, in, in healthcare. So a 550% rise in demand for clinical medical health support. Um, and that, um, that, that one of the really horrific things that you mentioned is the fact that on average a doctor takes their own life within it um, every three weeks yeah um, 
it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to talk about this, quite honestly, Graham. My background is as a psychiatry doctor. And so when the pandemic started, one of the first things that I was immediately aware of was the pressure that people were going to be under and a lot of people making a lot of sacrifices, doing things like living apart from their relatives, working all hours, putting themselves in harm's way. And there were so many examples of that and so many examples of really awful stuff going on, like doctors in the first weeks of the pandemic being told not to wear masks because wearing masks was going to scare patients. This was in oh, their workplaces. People were told that. Yep. Um, there was one hospital that set up what they called, God, what were they called? Like some like hallway monitors basically who were going up and down the hallways telling off staff for wearing masks because they were worried about panic setting in i mean there was all kinds of stuff happening it was awful um or for example junior members of staff or temporary members of staff when there were shortages of ppe often the ppe would be kept in a locked cupboard and you'd have to approach a senior member of the team in order to be given a mask and we, there were lots of situations where temporary members of staff or more junior members of staff would feel intimidated by that and wouldn't ask for what they needed or they wouldn't advocate for themselves enough. There were loads of examples, which I don't think have had enough attention, really, where, you know, members of nursing staff or healthcare workers or porters or whatever would be told to go and care for patients, even if they didn't have the PPE they needed. And what we noticed was that there was a gradient it was like a power gradient, really, and people feeling assertive enough to speak up about their lack of protection. Yeah. And then when we started hearing about people dying, a lot of the people who died, Graham, were the people who hadn't accessed that PPE. And there was a map created showing where all the healthcare workers had died around the country and what their roles had been. A lot of the time, it was people who were in positions where they had less power to sort of speak up for themselves. And that was horrifying to see. So now kind of coming out of the pandemic, I mean, I really hope that lessons are learned from this COVID inquiry that's going on. Yeah, it starts but, to, well, the, the public um, hearings start today, don't they, for the uh, COVID inquiry. Does, yeah. does every doctor have anything in that? Are, 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 have you got any representatives talking at it? We've, um, I was approached actually yesterday to do an interview about it, and I'm still not sure if we're going to, because we, we did speak up um about the lack of COVID preparedness before the pandemic, about yeah. um, exercise sickness that went on and the fact that the government didn't learn lessons. And we created a COVID report as well, showing the experiences so, of frontline just, doctors we so, worked with. Just on to the... mention about sickness. So what was sickness? So sickness was an exercise that was done um, several years before the pandemic. And it exercises and simulations are done nationally on various different situations every so often. And the idea is that we learn from these simulations of emergencies happening and it allows services to work together to make plans so that if any of these things happen, that services can kind of work together and move quickly to safeguard the public. But one of these simulations happened and there was a very clear set of outcomes from the exercise showing things we needed to do, like stockpiling enough PPE was one of the outcomes. And the government didn't enact all of the recommendations from the report and we then entered the pandemic and one of the biggest problems was a lack of the protective equipment which was in date that we needed because some of the stuff that we had been storing um had warped and broken and gone out of date in the intervening years that's kind of painful that that exercise was done and one of the things that was that came out from that exercise was that we didn't have enough PPE. And mm. if, if this ever happened, and the thing is, like, it's not like we didn't know that a pandemic was going to happen. We made movies about the fact that there was going to be a pandemic at some point, mm -hmm. and it, these are the things that were going to happen. If you want, it, it, is it? Um, there's a there was a, like a 2010 movie, wasn't there, with Jude Law in it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't Bain, remember what it was called, but yeah, called no, you're Outbreak. right. Not Outbreak. That was the one with Dustin Hoffman. But yeah, the, essentially, you had a mo Contagion. 
I think it was Contagion. Yes. Uh, and um, yeah, exactly how it played out in that, although the mortality was higher in that in that film, but um, it, it played out. It got spread around the world very, very quickly by air transport. And we should be prepared for this kind of thing. But future planning is not something that, that, that governments are, are well known for doing. But um, yeah, to move on from uh, support for healthcare workers, you also talk in the book about the need for better training. Um, so could you elaborate on that a little bit? Do you mean the training for doctors and nurses in the NHS? Yeah. yeah. So they get really they get really good training at the moment. And the, part of the problem we do have is that people are so inundated with having to deliver patient care all the time that it's preventing some of our staff from going and doing their essential training days and things like that. That's yeah. a real problem. Um, but the NHS still, I mean, thinking about the positives, we do have some really fantastic universities and we have some fantastic people t- teaching those students and everything. I'm a bit worried about future plans because I don't know if you've seen this, Graham, but the government have said they're going to get thousands of school leavers to start in September. Um, oh, yes. For coming... <laughs> so oh, like I mean... 18 year olds making life and death decisions almost. I mean... It can't it's be difficult to know how it's even going to work, to be honest. I mean, you know, at, at the best of times, I think something like this would need a lot of thought and planning as to who was going to mm. teach them and how they were going to get the training they needed. Because it's very daunting when you first start working in a clinical environment because people need your help and you don't necessarily have all the answers. Um, but also right now we're missing, in England alone, we're missing 124,000 NHS staff. And so these school leavers are apparently being recruited to kind of plug gaps but who's going to teach them we're missing so many staff that the existing staff don't really have the time to be running university courses for students it's just yeah it just seems like yet another you know sort of sound bite really you you also talk about the way admin staff have been taken out, which means that doctors end up writing letters to patients. So the you know the hunched over the 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 the, the, the um, laptop writing a letter to a patient, which is not a great use of their time, considering these no. people have been trained for years and years to actually cure people of disease and and give people operations that they need. Them. There's there's been some myths I think in recent years about wastage within the NHS. I mean. It's an enormous system and there are emergencies. And I think anyone working within the NHS would accept that and, you know, would actually really agree that change needs to be made. But sometimes there's this myth that admin staff aren't needed or that management aren't needed or something. And it's absolutely nonsense because if you think about how a hospital runs, you need the clinical staff, but you also need the people who keep the systems running and do the admin and do loads of the other important tasks. It can't all just be done by doctors and nurses. Um, at the end of the day, if you only have doctors and nurses, then like you say, Graham, they'll end up taking on the admin and then they're yeah. not with their patients enough, you know? So it has real impacts on patients. If you get rid of, they got rid of a lot of administrators during the austerity years. That's what's happened. Yeah. You also talk about um, things like telephone consultation being used as a weapon to demonise GPs in the national mm-hmm. press. There was a campaign in the mail to stop GPs hiding behind their phones. And it was like, yeah. for most people, including myself, being able to just speak to the GP over the phone is a is a benefit because it means I don't have to take time out from work to go to the GP and they, they can tell me, you know, if, 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 if it, they do feel like it's something that they need to see, they can come in, I can go in and mm. that system works better for me. And it feels like the same thing of like uh, MPs getting involved in working from home and saying, Oh no, you shouldn't be working from home. And mm. it's like, if it works for people, what is the problem? Mm. I, and I didn't, I don't really understand that at all. What are you talking about? Sorry, go on. Yeah, no. So there's quite a lot of, misunderstanding about this because of what's been in the papers so what happened at the beginning of the pandemic was gps were told centrally they got a a letter saying you've got to move most of what you're doing to telephone consultations and it was being done for safety reasons they wanted to restrict people coming into contact with each other if it was unnecessary right because there was a pandemic going on and we were trying to prevent the spread of a virus which was killing people And it was actually GPs at the beginning of the pandemic who were pushing back on that because they said, yeah, 
great in some circumstances some things can be managed safely over the phone and some people also appreciate that like you said graham but there's some situations where you need to have your patient in front of you clinically examined you know because you can't tell everything over the phone some things you just need to see or talk to someone or see how they're doing so you know i've been in contact with so many gps over the last three years i don't know of a single gp who moved fully to telephone consultations no. anyway there's always been a mixture and people have just been muddling yeah. through the best they can right yeah. but coming out of the major wave of the pandemic there was a real felt like a concerted media campaign attacking gps for all kinds of things you know words were being yeah. used about them being lazy hiding behind telephones not wanting to see patients and it it was really really unfair um this gps have never been busier the, you know how much we love the nhs have a round of applause we'll paint it on the on the road we love the nhs yeah. and then as soon as we're out the pandemic it's like oh screw those guys well yeah and i mean what's <laughs> happened if you think about it so the, the the waiting lists right now are the longest they've ever been in the NHS's yeah. history. And the waiting lists are mostly of people who are waiting to see a specialist for treatment in a hospital. And while you're waiting to see your specialist, the person who's responsible for your treatment is your GP. And so GPs more than ever before are really busy looking after patients who actually they need some support looking after, but they're not getting enough support. They're holding this huge burden of illness. So GPs are under just the most enormous amount of pressure at the moment. Because yeah. I don't know, people might know this already, but GPs don't have like shift times. They don't start and stop usually. If you're a GP running a surgery, like a GP partner, you have responsibility for a group of patients. And so you just have to stay until the work's done. And I know one GP who ended up doing a 24 hour shift one day because they just couldn't get through the work. You know, it's just, it's been awful. And this campaign that was seemingly being waged in the right wing media um, had real consequences for GPs. You know, I would get messages from people saying my patients are so angry, they can't understand why there's no appointments. All of my admin staff have resigned because they can't deal with the abuse we're getting on the front desk. We had situations where doors were getting kicked in. There was one GP surgery near Manchester, Graham, where a patient came in deeply frustrated, right? Because people are deeply frustrated, but then attacked a number of members of staff and fractured the skull of a GP. And, you know, the GPs I'm talking to are saying, well, we think it's a result of what's being written in the papers. You know, people are scared and they're angry and then they read that and then they take it out on the staff. And I think that's just really, really wrong. And it's had massive impacts on... Yeah people's personal lives you know gps have left the nhs because of all of this and that's devastating well i I want to talk a little bit about intent here we had Teresa coffee she was she was the least healthy health secretary for a week wasn't she under liz truss and she said that she wants to hold the nhs to account and then you had steve barkley saying the nhs doesn't need any more money and you've got to think for a moment like these people hate the nhs they hate the idea of the nhs they want to go back to a healthcare system where it's based on your socioeconomic circumstances. And if you're doing well, you will get treated. If you're not doing well, it's a bit of a lottery. And do you, do you think that that is the situation we're with with the Conservatives at the moment? Do you think most of them are these sort of uh, IEA style, you know, uh, libertarians who think that, you know, everyone else just has to fend for themselves? I mean, it's horrifying and interesting in equal measure i would say seeing the difference in the rhetoric coming from the conservative party because for a number of years we were campaigning against all the stuff they were doing and they would be going to the papers with their little nhs badge telling everyone they loved the service and they supported the service while for example in matt hancock's case featuring in a privately paid for healthcare advert for a private company at the same time you know so it was all double speak And now we're in a different phase of their sort of actions towards the NHS, where I feel like we're finally seeing a little bit of honesty here. I mean, (laughs) Rishi Sunak a few months ago said that he wanted to start charging patients for missing GP appointments. Um, We've seen um, Sajid Javid saying that he thinks that NHS patients should be charged. And while that's horrible and horrifying and actually goes against the NHS constitution, in a way, if there's going to be that honesty, at least it allows us to have a conversation about it, you know. Um, one of my concerns about Labour is that, you know, 
as we've said, they're going to continue the private outsourcing and talk about how great privatization is. But they're not really doing it in such an honest way, I don't feel. I mean, they still talk about themselves as the party of the NHS, etc. Yeah. And in my mind, uh, those yeah. things don't align. Well, from my point of view, I mean, I, I agree with you totally about the, the privatised stuff. But in general, I think that the Tories that we have in it at the moment, they are fundamentally opposed to the NHS. Mm. Labour are not, I don't think, I don't feel fundamentally opposed to the NHS. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the Labour Party. I assume they'll be in the Tories or Reform or Reclaim or whatever they call themselves these days on the right wing. Um, but there is that worry of the encroaching American style private healthcare insurance scheme. And you look at it and you're like, that is the worst possible way to run a, a health system in America. They spend more money on Medicaid and Medicare than it would cost to actually just give everyone free healthcare, because then that would stop yeah. the monopoly of these healthcare providers who, or medicine providers who basically can charge whatever they like. You know, yeah, I, I, yeah. You, you you want to buy a Ventolin inhaler? Yeah, that'd be a hundred dollars, please. Oh, mm -hmm. you, you want to go somewhere else to buy it? We'll see you in Cuba. You know, it, it, yeah. it, you, it, when it's your health, you, you you're not going to argue. And you, I I've, I know so many horror stories about people in America and what's happened to them um, as a result of, of the, the healthcare system that they've had over there. People have lost their homes, lost their jobs, all kind of, you know, being, being yeah. saddled with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt. And for anyone to look at that over the water and go, oh God, that, 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 that's what I wish our system was like. The, 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 <laughs> from the moon. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> awful. It's all, I mean, it's the number one cause of bankruptcy in the US, you know, medical, yeah medical related reasons for all the reasons you've just said graham people get sick and then they fall out of the workforce and then it impacts on their family members and it can break down relationships and people lose their homes i mean it's it's absolutely horrifying what goes on um and i don't mean to sound like i'm bashing everyone in labor either like uh, you know i am critical of some of the policies that star and streeting are putting up there critical. but actually there's that'd be a good name for a book julia <laughs> The, in the book, I do talk about some of my criticisms about some of the policies coming out from Starmer's leadership at the moment. But there is also a group of Labour MPs who are staunch advocates of the NHS and have just done amazing work for years and years and continue to do so. I think I just feel like if Labour wants to hold on to that badge of being the party of the NHS, they're going to have to explain their policies a bit better and, mm. to my mind, do a bit more, you know, in terms of supporting the workforce and getting rid of that outsourcing because there'll be a lot of people I expect watching this, listening to this and who are waiting for the next general election to happen, hoping, hoping things are going to improve afterwards. But Well, I mean, if I look at sort of the, the Brown Blair years, um, I, I think like you do that the PFI was completely misguided. It was a bad idea. They should have done it differently. But I also see it as they were trying to make the NHS as good as possible. And realistically, in 2010, the NHS was, you know, in, in, in good health compared with how it is today. Now, you talk in the book about them basically damaging the foundations of the NHS, which they papered over by putting money into the NHS, which obviously helped. But when I think about the actual fundamental principles of a political party, I think that Labour and Labour MPs, all the ones that I, I know and I've, I've met, are very, very supportive of the NHS. Whereas I look over at the Conservatives and what I see is a bunch of people who want to destroy the NHS the same way that they destroyed British Rail by running down the services to, services to a point where people are looking at this going, well, I'll just go private then because that'll be a better service. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think in terms of what the Conservative government are doing at the moment, I would agree with you. But I actually think if you ask the general public like when they have been asked do you support the future of the nhs do you support the core principles of the nhs etc the vast majority of people support that regardless yeah. of what their political beliefs are actually i think it's it's something that gets politicized because of the way that governments behave towards the nhs but i think actually the public broadly all think the same thing even if you're a conservative voter most people want the service to be well funded and like you're saying graham it's a mixture of two things so this is my perspective and i kind of set this out in a bit more clarity in the book 
the NHS is failing because of two reasons. One is the reforms that have changed the structure of the service. So the architecture of the system has been dismantled because of all the privatisation that's been allowed to get in. Yeah. And the other thing is the underfunding. And Labour, when they were in charge, when Blair was in charge, they were making these reforms, bringing in the PFI debt, all of that stuff. It wasn't long term thinking at all because they are part of the reason we're in the situation we are now. But they also were throwing enormous amounts of money at the service. And so, like you say, it was functioning well. Yeah. Um, if you think about that car analogy well, again, yeah, yeah, it was like the car was going along and they were putting loads of petrol in it and doing loads of surface things to keep the car going. But then the I internal it looked great yeah and and the waiting lists were brought down etc yes. etc but the problem and you see was a GP within three weeks yeah, yeah well yeah a lot quicker than that i think <laughs> but the internal structure of the car wasn't being serviced they weren't taking responsibility for that so when it got yeah. handed over to the conservative government there was problems already there you know it's and so of course when the conservatives starved the service of the funding stopped putting the petrol in the car and doing all the little tweaks that need to be done mm. it's been very apparent that you know the service is not in a functioning state now um no, it's not and you were talking about infrastructure in the book about you know the two temperatures of an nhs hospital being freezing or roasting yeah I mean, i've experienced that i mean i'm i'm you know i'm, I'm just a pundit i'm not i'm not a, a punter sorry i'm, I'm not a, a doctor or a healthcare professional but having to work in situations like last summer when we hit 40 degrees outside and in these hospitals people were fainting weren't they healthcare yeah. workers were, were, yeah. were fainting in the hospitals mm -hmm. so in the book uh in general you, you you pinpoint six things that you feel need to be done paying off the pfi debt now this is something that would be i think difficult for labor possibly to sell to the electorate because it would be like paying off a debt that might benefit a government in the future why are you spending this money now on what needs to be paid off now but i think that having a situation in which that debt is paid off quicker and looking at it the same way labor are looking at the uh, the railways at the moment which is they're going to just wait till instead of spending millions and possibly billions of pounds buying the franchises back they're just going to let them run out and then take them back into public ownership um, the second thing is paying staff properly, which I hope Labour will take seriously. Um, and I could see that happening. Building the technology we need. And this is probably a bit of a source, source spot for Labour, isn't it? Because um, didn't the IT rollout, I seem to remember, about 20 years ago, they made an absolute pig's ear of it, spent like, what, 10 billion or something, and mm. it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean... It wasn't an absolutely mammoth task, you know, um, it would be really difficult, but actually more difficult now because the NHS has become more fragmented in the last 20 years, you know, so trying to get all of those different services run by outsourced providers to all use the same system would be really tricky. Um, which is another reason we should get rid of outsourcing, to be honest, well, but, um, yeah. you know, uh, it is absolutely ludicrous that in the UK we have a public healthcare system, but services can't talk easily to one another about a patient's healthcare, right? So we've got yeah. situations at the moment where let's imagine you were on holiday and you went to the local A&E department because you had a problem. It might be difficult for your doctor or nurse looking after you to access all of your medical notes quickly. And that can have an impact on people's care, you know? It's yeah. just, should, it's just obvious. I mean, we're in 2023, it's, you know, it's just, it should be easier than it is, you know, that it is really important. Yeah, obviously. Um, I mean, Google and Facebook know what, where you went on holiday 15 years ago and what yeah. charges you were wearing. So it should be something that could be put together uh, one way or another. But um, yeah, you also talk about ta tackling sustainability, going back to the whole freezing cold or, or absolutely roasting yeah. in, in hospitals. And this this also comes down to modernizing hospitals. You often you, you talk in the book about hospitals just not being fit for purpose anymore because they're so old. And, yeah, um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I feel like... It, <sighs> especially with these hospitals, the PFI funded hospitals, you're going to have a hospital in 2050. That is absolutely useless. And we're still paying loads of money off the debt that we incur. Well, yeah, I mean, getting it built in I, the first place. I think the, the basis for the book, the reason I've written the book is because the government or any government who takes on the running of the NHS are not just taking on the running of a service, which they're free to mold and shape and do whatever they want with. 
they're supposed to be running a service which fulfills three aims and it's a long-term project to try and provide care that's equal for everyone try and provide comprehensive care and try and provide care which meets patients where they are with their clinical needs so that if you're sicker you get looked at first right that's the way this is supposed to work and it's supposed to be fair pfi debt is a debt that affects some healthcare facilities but not all Mm. and it impacts on the funding that any local healthcare provider has right so actually Keeping PFI debt is introducing inequality into our healthcare systems. That's one of the reasons I think so it should be abolished. So you end up with a postcode lottery. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the reasons oh, yeah, we have a postcode right. lottery, right? I haven't um, thought of it like that. And then, if you think about the sustainability bit, Graham, we've also got this situation now where you know, as a society, we're coming to terms with the idea that climate crisis is happening. It's a huge problem that we're barely tackling at all, right? But but if you just looked at hospitals, some of the hospitals we have in the NHS have existed for longer than the NHS has existed. They're very old buildings. And the reasons that those temperatures are so, you know, really, really hot or really, really cold is because some of these buildings are over 100 years old and they've got very, very old plumbing and drafty buildings. And it's awful, right? You've got um, equipment functioning in these places with narrow corridors a lot of it just isn't fit for purpose anymore um we do need to think about all of this if we want the nhs to survive in the coming decades um and someone at some point is going to have to make that financial outlay it like you say i think we probably do need to be practical about it and think no one's going to come up with that money overnight but perhaps it it is a longer term plan yeah I'm I'm interested in what you just said about it being a postcode lottery because I never thought about that because different trusts owe up different amounts of PFI debt. So restructuring that debt so it's a national debt <laughs> might be an idea. So it's fairly distributed amongst all. Well, it, it's not they, it's not it shouldn't be something that they have to worry about. It should be something that the government say, okay, well we allocated X amount of money to the NHS to yep. pay off these debts um, and and hopefully get that paid off quicker than twenty uh, fifty. You also talk about ending outsourcing, which, um, yeah, I can't disagree with that because it, I, 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 my analogy here is always going to be with the trains because I think the trains have just absolutely just been ruined by years of privatization. Now mm-hmm. it costs me £200 to go to London on the train. £200. Mm-hmm. I mean, what mm-hmm. the hell? I, I, I've i flown to Australia in the past for less than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, the idea that, that that's that's just standard now. That's your standard ticket. I think it's £250 actually for a, a, an any time return now from Durham to London is is just insane. Um, but one of the mad things is I go through York whenever I go down south or where I go to Liverpool. And there's about like seven or eight different train operators that go through York. And my train will stop if it, especially if it's a TPE, Trans Pennine Express, because they're awful. And they'll be like, sorry, we've got to wait because we need a conductor. And they've got to come because we, we're out of conductors. And like, if it was all one company, mm, like a mm-hmm. publicly owned company, they could get any conductor off any other train and put them on that train. But because the conductors, the cleaners, the drivers are all employed by the one company, they can't work for another company that mm. are servicing the same station mm-hmm. who probably just come mm-hmm. off work. Oh, do, can you do another hour's overtime? Yeah, sure. Jump on the next train, drive it. You know, it's just, and I see that in the NHS. You've got someone who's who's got the contract to do the cleaning in a hospital or one part of it or whatever, and they don't turn up. You can't just get someone else. It, well, it's you just want to think as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the trains are such a good example of it and people feel it because it's them paying for the private company, isn't it? So, you know, yeah. you see the cost of these tickets going up and some of the trains are really old or they're not very clean or whatever. It's just, it's not a nice experience, is it, traveling on a train anymore? But um, if you think about it simply in terms of what is the goal of a public service, the NHS is not a static thing. We're never going to have a situation where we're like, if we build this number of hospitals, then it will be perfect 40. and it will work forevermore. You know, exactly. 40 new hospitals. But, or like we have a certain number of staff, it will be perfect. We have a changing population. The demographics of our population are changing. The healthcare needs and the expectations are changing. It's a project. Yeah. It's a long-term project, right? But if we can keep our eyes on the goal and the goal is we are trying to do something that is equal for everyone. We are trying to create comprehensive care and keep everybody safe and it's free at the point of use. And that is the goal. That's hard enough to achieve with all of this other stuff going on, like the population changing and blah, blah, blah. 
yeah. if you introduce profit into that, then that changes the decision making because the people running the service have got to, you know, they've got another priority. They're trying to make money for shareholders. Keep the shareholders happy, yeah. And that, that <laughs> usually in other countries, yeah. I think yeah, I think like, I, the, the trains works really well to show this is what will happen to the NHS if if we allow it. When you talk about people, uh, like the cost of people don't understand the cost. Something that you mentioned in the book about uh, just how much things cost in the NHS. I, I always remember back when I was living in Oval Park in Liverpool, I was on the dole at the time, or no, income support I was on at the time. And I was um, helped by the PDSA for my cat. And they took my cat in and they gave him an x-ray and kept him in overnight. And then I got a bill at the end of it of how much it would have cost mm. if it wasn't a charity. And it was like 600 quid. And mm. at the time, that was more than I earned in a month. And I was just like, "What? thank you. Th thank you. And it made me really, really appreciate the PDSA. And now if I ever give to an animal charity, it'll be the PDSA. And I feel like that's something that I wish people understood with the NHS is just how much this stuff costs that we kind of just take for granted because it's always been free for us. And maybe we should have a look at what people go through in the States and, and sort of compare, compare that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe that would help. It always seems a bit harsh kind of telling people that, you know, because you just want to focus on the care aspect of it all. But it might make people think differently about it. Something that really annoys me, though, on the sort of similar lines is when things get really busy in the NHS and the politicians and other organisations tell the public, like, only going to A&E if you're really, really sick. <laughs> you think, no one goes to A&E like, because they just love A&E, you know. <laughs> if someone's going to A&E, it's because they feel they need to be seen. Sometimes they don't need to be seen. Sometimes they've gone there out of anxiety or they need some yeah, reassurance yeah. or whatever. But the answer isn't to tell people not to access healthcare services when they think they need it. Like, I find that really yeah. annoying. Especially men. I mean, a lot of men die because they don't go and get healthcare because they're like, oh, I can't, I can't possibly be ill. I'm a man. Yeah, so I mean, some, some of the patients who access healthcare services who are the sickest say, oh, I didn't want to come earlier. I know how busy you guys are. I've seen what's going on in the news. So I thought I'd just stay at home for a bit longer and try something, you know, take painkillers or whatever. And, you know, I think any messaging that people shouldn't be accessing healthcare when they feel they need it is can be really negative. It can be dangerous for people. Yeah, yeah. So just before we wrap up, um, what, what sort of changed with you when you... Um became more aware of the sort of the NHS sort of holistically of what was happening in it and how you felt uncomfortable with the direction that the NHS was going in? Well, I was working as a psychiatry doctor in London and looking after some of the most vulnerable people in our society because people who have severe and enduring mental illness and who require inpatient admission for psychiatry um, are often isolated they're often having lots of other difficulties in their life like addiction they might have relationship problems um, and I I suppose because of that became aware of how as the austerity cuts were coming in they were disproportionately affecting people who were already vulnerable and who didn't have much of a voice in all of this and I talk about this in the book but there was an example where I was working in an A&E department overnight and when you're working as a junior doctor in psychiatry overnight, assessing people in A&E, you see people in really vulnerable circumstances who've come to A&E because quite often they feel very desperate. They're either incredibly unwell with, um, you know, an illness such as schizophrenia or they're there because something has happened in their personal life and it's brought them to a point of crisis. And I had an instance one night with a man who was homeless at the time and he needed help. He was really struggling and he was having some suicidal ideas, but he wasn't sufficiently unwell that we could provide him an inpatient bed. Because even back then, and this is going back to sort of 2015 now, um, we didn't have enough beds and, you know, we were having to decide who got the bed. We were already having to use private hospitals for some of our patients transferring patients out and so there was already a juggle back then you know sometimes we'd be told when we got to work there's no psychiatric beds available in the trust today and and that weighs upon clinicians minds and when this man was discharged 
during that period of time, some of the local charities were losing their funding as well. Um, austerity cuts had massive impacts in the care sector. And so he walked away, it was in the middle of the night, and I just remember seeing him going, and I'd made a referral to the community team who I hoped would kind of pick up his care at a later date and link up with him, and make sure he was okay. But I think the awareness that the safety net was being impacted by the austerity cuts was just really difficult to tolerate because um, and I'm not alone in this. I, I trained in the NHS. And I think if you trained in the NHS in the early 2000s, which I did, there was such a pride at what we were going to be able to provide for people. And it felt incredibly special and incredibly powerful. And recognising when you're working in that system that the care is being rationed, even back then, and this is going back eight years now, you know, even even that. It felt really horrible. And I suppose, you know, it's it's got worse and worse since then. I feel so dreadfully for people who don't have a voice. Um, because the people who are most impacted by all of this are the people who we don't hear from in the media. I've been paying quite a lot of attention recently, Graham, because there's a lot of focus on people going private for their health care. But we don't hear much from the people who can't afford to go private. We don't hear much from the homeless people or the people who've you know, arrived in this country and might not speak the language or so many other groups, you know, who have difficulties for lots of different reasons. And my view about it is the NHS is for everybody. And that was what I loved about working within the system. I thought it was so special and extraordinary. And I felt really proud about it. So I feel like I'm going to cry. I keep crying in these interviews. About the book. Oh, don't cry. My feeling about it, Graham, is that we built the NHS coming out of the Second World War. Yeah, And the country was in such a state, but what the war had shown people was that we only survive well as a society if we rely upon each other. And that's how we can build progress in our society. And I feel like this issue gets so politicised in the media and by politicians themselves, but most members of the public will manage to, to survive. And we have, you know, we have the power to rebuild it. We really do, because we built it in the first place from nothing. And so there's something hopeful there, right? I think if we yeah. could connect enough people together and speak about it and just listen to one another and work out what needs to be done, then we could rebuild this. Um, yeah, I just, sorry, that wasn't very articulate. I get quite no, choked was, up talking about yeah, it. No, I get it. I get it from the ruins and the rubble of World War Two was born the NHS. And now we're in a similar situation with the economy and obviously coming out of COVID this seems like an opportunity for us to to um, change things for the better. I'd like to wrap up with a with a quote from your, well, a quote, it's not from your book, it's a quote in your book, I should say, um, which is from William Beveridge, who wrote the Beveridge Report in 1942, the report that could help give rise to the NHS in the first place. A revolutionary moment in the world's history is a time for revolutions, not for patching. So thank you very much for joining us on hard labor here on uh, labor social dr julia grace patterson and your book critical is available from all good and bad booksellers from <laughs> ja like like amazon <laughs> from june the 22nd is that right yeah it, it can be pre-ordered now and it, hopefully it will be in a few shops um next week so um Yep, it can be ordered online on HarperCollins or any of the big bookshop um, websites. Thank you for listening, everybody. And thank you so much, Graham, for having me. You're very welcome. And until next time, hello, good evening, welcome, and goodbye.